Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. Today is Thursday, the 18th of February of 2021, and I'm Eddie Joe. Today, I'm going to be talking about Geopreza, also called Angiotensin 2. The study that I'm going to be using as a citation for today's podcast was published a couple days ago in the journal Chest, and it is titled Angiotensin 2 Infusion for Shock a multi-center study of post-marketing use. I have to tip my hat to the authors of this study. I do have to disclose that I have zero experience using Geopreza or uh, its generic name, angiotensin II, in my clinical practice. I do not have access to it. I've never used it. I don't know how to dose it. I don't know how to titrate it. So again, I always recommend you read the article for yourself and don't trust me. For those of you who do not know what angiotensin II is, basically it's a new vasopressor that came out just a couple of years ago. The type of vasopressor that it is is described as a, quote, synthetic analog of the endogenous human peptide with high affinity for G-protein coupled type 1 angiotensin receptors. I have discussed the initial study, the ATHOS-3 trial, in the past, and perhaps I was a little bit too critical on it. I happen to have a, an acquaintance now with the gentleman who is a great physician who who actually was the lead author on the Athos 3 trial. And again, he's a great clinician, great guy, and I'm getting to know him little by little. And the more I meet him and the more I interact with him, the more I like him. Maybe that might be influencing my, my interpretation of uh, that study because at the end of the day, I know the guy has a great, great heart. The other thing about it, and the reason why I think sometimes I'm a little bit too critical on that first trial is because I don't actually do research. And this team actually created the Athos 3 trial. Uh, I'm a boots on the ground doc. I feel, I feel bad that I criticized it the way I do. I did. But, you know, now that that's out of the way, I mean, I still, I still am excited about the prospects of a new vasopressor. I want anything that we could do to help my patients get out of shock, but I really hope that the cost comes down because to my knowledge, it still costs about $1,500 a vial. If this is incorrect, please correct me and I will walk back my words. What they did in the ethos 3 trial was uh, take sh real shock patients who are norepinephrine and they either gave them the study drug, um, which has honestly been known since the 1930s to cause an increase in blood pressure, or they got a placebo. It's, it's basically uh, giving a hungry person food or air and seeing which, which one made them feel full. Obviously, the delicious meal group felt full. But one of the things that was pretty funny about the ATHOS-3 trial was that 23.4% of the patients who received placebo had an increase in their blood pressure. So I always find that, I always find that funny. Since the ATHOS-3 trial, there honestly hasn't been another prospective randomized control trial looking at angiotensin 2. But I guess that's just the nature of the beast. There are a couple things littered on clinicaltrials.gov, which is where I, I always look to see if somebody's researching something but I didn't find a uh, extensive amount of research that's currently going on. But again, this, this particular study that I'm using as a reference was published on the 1st of January in CHEST, and it's a multi-center post-marketing study on angiotensin II infusion of, of in shock, excuse me. As I, noticed, as I noted before, I initially wasn't too enthusiastic from using angiotensin II, and as I mentioned, there's only been one RCT to date on this trial. I want to be very clear here that this study is a retrospective study, and therefore there are intrinsic limitations to this. So just please keep that in mind. What the question, the question that the authors were seeking was an answer for the safety and actual effectiveness of angiotensin II. Because in the Athos 3 trial, excuse me, as I got tongue-tied there, it turns out that there was a higher incidence of deep vein thrombosis in these patients than what is usually expected. So a lot of people, including myself, have had trepidation on using the drug for that reason. And I cannot go through all the thorough details of this study. So as always, I recommend you read it for yourself. But what they were able to do was end up collecting a total of 270 patients. Of these 270 patients, 181 were considered to be responders and 89 patients were considered to be non-responders. From a shock etiology standpoint, because we have to know what type of shock these, these patients were having, it turns out that septic shock was the majority of the patients encompassing more than 50% of the population. The second highest group was postoperative vasoplegia, which was about 10 to 11% of patients falling into this category. 
many of those, many of us who work in the cardiothoracic surgery world know exactly what postoperative vasoplegia is. And there was also a multifactorial shock etiology group which is many times what we see in our patients who they have, you know, a little bit of septic shock and a little bit of cardiogenic shock or, you know, a little bit of post, post-operative vasoplegia with a little bit of cardiogenic shock component to it. And then this encompassed about 27 to 28% of the patients in this study. When we look at the characteristics of the patients, the vast majority were either on two or three vasopressors at the time of angiotensin II initiation. Over 90% of the patients were on norepinephrine and even in the non-responder group, which had a lower incidence of being on vasopressin, still over 80% of patients were also on vasopressin. In other words, in this study, it doesn't seem as if angiotensin II was the first line vasopressor in these patients. There's a difference that caught my eye in the baseline char- characteristics, and is that there was a statistically significant difference between the amount of responders who were on corticosteroids compared to the non-responders there was a difference between those two groups receiving steroids. And, you know, the data is extensive in showing that utilization of stressful steroids decreases the time that somebody is in shock. And so in my opinion, this could be a confounder. The authors ended up finding that of the 270 patients that were included in the study, 67% of them had a positive effect to the hemodyn- to their hemodynamics due to angiotensin II. So this means that 23% of patients had no response whatsoever to angiotensin II. And this really doesn't surprise me, even though, you know, you really would want it to work on 100% of your patients. The truth is that some medications just don't work on anybody. And this is something that we should be aware of in most drugs we administer to patients. In the people in whom this medication worked, though, they saw a greater increase in their mean arterial pressure. So in other words, it made their blood pressure go up. Good job as well as a reduction in the dose of other vasopressors that they were receiving at the time. So once they got started on angiotensin II, their levofed probably came down or their epinephrine or phenylephrine, etc. So these are just things that they... It also turns out that the patients who had a lower lactate level did better than those who had a high lactate level. But the truth is, is, this should come as no surprise, as there's already a correlation that exists in the literature that's very, very impressive, that high lactate is associated with mortality. Notice that I said correlation, not causation. Many of you guys know that lactate and lactic acid is one of my, one of my peeves, or one of the things I try to focus on a lot. Patients also did better with angiotensin II when they were receiving vasopressin. That's just some of the data that the authors were able to tease out of this retrospective study. In addition, the authors, and I don't mean any disrespect when I say this, but I do it for comical reasons, but the authors also performed some statistical jumping jacks, and they were able to determine that, quote, hemodynamic responsiveness to angiotensin II was associated with a reduced likelihood of 30-day mortality. So, you know, they're saying it could help decrease mortality, which is something that we all would wish for with any drug we administer to our patients. One of the questions from the original trial looking at angiotensin II that I already mentioned before was the increased risk of deep vein thrombosis. It seems as there was a higher incidence of this pathology in the patients who were receiving angiotensin II in the ATHOS-3 trial. In this particular retrospective study, though, it doesn't seem as if there was an increased risk of developing DVTs. But let's be honest with ourselves. This is a retrospective study. They only found four cases. It's not like they were actually screening everybody. And again, I don't think screening everybody is feasible because we don't regularly do that in our practice anyway. The question that I have for myself every time I read one of these studies and possibly a question that you're asking yourself is, will these data change my practice? And, you know, I could sit back and say, I would love for there to be an independently conducted, you know, in other words, not pharmaceutical sponsored, randomized control trial using angiotensin II, for example, versus norepinephrine. But the truth is, I don't foresee this happening in the near future. And honestly, on clinicaltrials.gov, I did not see anybody uh, looking this up or any study like this coming down the pipeline. That being said, I'm I'm interested in potentially utilizing this medication in the near future for my patients who are in refractory shock. Um, You know, those patients who are 
on vasopressors, of which one should include vasopressin, and patients who are also on stress dose steroids. Because uh, my interpretation of the study, which again might be erroneous, is that the, these subgroups of patients were more likely to be responsive to the angiotensin too. I'm really quite interested to see how patients who have post-op vasoplegia, you know, pa patients in the cardiothoracic surgery world do with this medication as well. But those are just my thoughts on all this. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are and what you think about this medication and whether or not you have uh, experience using this medication. So if you're, you know, watching this on YouTube, obviously leave me a thumbs up as it helps the algorithm. Leave some comments down below. Let me know what your experience is with this medication. Obviously, we're seeing by this data that it does not work on 100% of patients. It's just unrealistic to expect such things. Um, but I, I just want to know what you all think, because again, I could be I could be completely wrong on this, and I already disclosed that I have no experience whatsoever with this medication, but I might have some in the near future. Hope you guys all learned something. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Appreciate your support. Bye.